Well, good morning. If you weren't here last week, today we're going to be continuing in 2 Peter. And if, uh, again, if you weren't here, I encourage you to go back on our YouTube channel and watch our service from last week. And so I'm going to give a brief recap, though, just to help refresh us and, and those who weren't here to kind of understand where we're going in the rest of 2 Peter. But last week we went through 2 Peter chapter 1 through uh, verse 11. And so this is Peter's second letter to believers. Uh, and the first letter in Peter was to baby Christians, new believers, who were needing spiritual milk, the basics of God's truth and understanding. And then in the second letter that he writes here, he's, he's, he's reaching the same people, but it's like six years later. And so they're ready for spiritual meat, as I pray everyone here is ready for some spiritual meat this morning. Amen? Amen. So growth and maturity. Peter shares three main points in this first 11 verses of spiritual growth. And the first one was a basis of growth, God's power. He granted us everything that we need, everything that we need in this life, everything we need through his knowledge, God's power, and then God's promises that through his glory and virtue, we can become partakers in his divine nature to help escape the corruption of this world because of sinful nature. We can become partakers, church, in God's divine nature. That's worth rejoicing. Yes, we are born into sinful nature, but we don't have to pursue that. No, we can pursue him. And because of that, God's promises, God's power, we can escape the corruptions of this sinful world. Amen. So number two, the process of growth. Make every effort to add to your faith these seven graces. And we went through virtue, knowledge, self-control, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. It seemed impossible. It seems impossible at times to be able to obtain these graces in our life. But if you need to, if you wake up and there's your wife's vanity or a mirror right there, I just challenge you to write on those, these graces. And every day, make that a pursuit. Like, Lord, this, today, I'm going to pursue these things. In the name of Jesus, spend the time in your quiet time praying God to help strengthen you, not by your own strength, but by his strength. Amen? And then thirdly, the necessity of growth, the work. For if these seven graces are yours and are increasing, not just that you obtained patience that one time last year, is that you continue to pursue these things of God. And increasingly will help counter unfruitfulness. Gain full knowledge of God. Full knowledge. Peter says here, not just knowledge, but full knowledge, something that we should pursue. Avoid spiritual blindness. We learned last week of, of being spiritually blind is nearsightedness. Um, and we have, we're not able to see what God has in store for us. Because we talked about, we have, everyone here has a purpose and has a calling, no matter what it may be. Some may be big. Some may be moving outside of this country and being on a mission field. Some may be just, you're a missionary here at your, at your job. It may be something, is that, but that's not to say that one's bigger than the other. Both have great purpose, okay? Because if just one person, one person that you talk to about hope and truth accepts Jesus, it was worth your entire life to save that one soul. Amen? So no matter where it's far or near, it's important. We learned uh, that increasing with all these graces will also give you... Um, more diligence in order to ensure your election and calling. Five was avoid stumbling into various acts of sin. Sin separates us from God. And we should avoid things such as we should know the temptations when they're there that if you continue to touch the pan that you know it's hot, it will burn you. I know it's easy for me to say this and it's hard for us to walk this out, but we should always try to avoid stumbling into various acts of sin. And number six was receive a good position in the kingdom. Not for us to 
have a goal of sliding into the kingdom of heaven by the skin of our teeth, or as I said last week, the doggy door. You know, that's still better than eternally separated from God. But for us, it should be, no, I'm not just going to be sliding in the doggy door. No, we need to be pursuing uh, of God's richness and entrance that we're rejoiced into the entrance of, of heaven. Amen? Oh, what a day that will be. Amen. All right, that was just a recap. So now, today, we're going to talk the means of growth. So if you haven't already turned there, turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. Father, we just pray right now, guys, we read your word, Lord Jesus, that is alive and moving. God, your authority, we just pray, Lord Jesus, right now, that you would speak to us, encourage us, convict us. God, whatever is, is needing, Lord Jesus, we pray for you, Lord, to move in this place. And we submit, God, to your authority. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 12, therefore, I will always remind you about these things, even though you already know them and are standing firm in the truth you have been taught. And it is only right that I should keep on reminding you as long as I live. For our Lord Jesus Christ has shown me that I must soon leave this earthly life. So I will work hard to make sure that you always remember these things after I am gone. So Peter here in this first part of verse 12 tells us the purpose of this letter. And the purpose of this letter is remembrance. Peter is reminding believers what they already know. They were once spiritual infants craving spiritual milk of the word. But now, now they know the truth of God's word. So again, going back to the first, uh, first Peter, he was giving them the basis of truth, and he's telling you here in this letter, even six years later, remember, remember what you have been taught. So church, remember what you have been taught, even if it's from Sunday school, or if it was from youth ministry, whatever it may be, remember what you have been taught. Every time that you read the word of God, you read truth, remember what you have learned, remember what you have been taught. The believers here, and let's just make it personal here at church today. Us is here. They are grounded, yet Peter reminds them the importance of what they have been taught. Remember what Jesus did on the cross for you. Just think about that just for a moment. Remember the moment that you, that Jesus was your Lord and your Savior. God, come into my life. I want to follow you. Forgive me for my sinful nature and for what, what it is that I bring to you. And you laid it at his feet of the cross. And because of his sacrifice, what he did on the cross, he paid the price for your sins. And he washed over your sins, making you pure as white as snow. Amen? You hear me this morning? Okay, I know the snow was a complete twist in our, our weather but yay, Virginia. <laughs> Remember what Jesus did for you. Never forget that, church. Another importance of why we take communion, to remember what Jesus did for us. And then verse 13, Peter gives the reason behind this. As long as I am alive. Now, here really... I know I'm reading from the New Living Translation, but here in verse 13, when he says, as long as I live, really means as long as I'm in this body. And then if you look at Greek, it's as long as I'm in this tabernacle, okay? A tent. It's temporary, okay? And Peter knows that it's temporary. He recognizes his body is temporary. And at this point, Peter is an old man. Peter also knows that he will die an unnatural death. Jesus indicated to Peter that he would die a martyr's death in John 21, 18. So Peter knows he's not going to die of old age, 
but he'll die a martyr's death because of his belief. But here, he's on mission. He's like, I know I'm going to die, and who knows when it's going to be, but I'm going to make sure that you guys always remember what you've been taught. Remember these truths. Remember God's promises and God's power and the authority that God gives you. In light of his coming death, there is an obligation spelled out here in verse 14, 15, I'm sorry, 15. After he has gone, Peter readers need to continue to bring things, these things to remembrance. So it wasn't always that, church, you remember what Jesus did for you. It wasn't always just that. It's also that you take that and remind others. So he's telling believers, remember, but then after I'm gone, make sure you remind others of what they have been saved from, what they have been taught, God's word. Amen? A reason. Number two here, Peter now addresses the authority of the apostles. So we're going to start reading verse 16. For we were not making up clever stories when we told you about the powerful coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We saw the majestic splendor with our own eyes when he received honor and glory from from God the Father. The voice from the majestic glory of God said to him, This is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. We're going to stop right there. This is powerful. We're going to unpack this. This this. This goes deep. Peter is referring to here in the first part of 16, we're not making up clever stories. It's talking about Jew, Jewish uh, myths and legends, okay, stories. And that's not what Peter, Peter's buying them. I'm not talking about myths and legend. I'm talking about truth, about the powerful coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter goes on to share a story of their eyewitness experience at Mount Hermon with Jesus, also known as Mount of Transfiguration. And we're just going to read that. It's Matthew 17. I don't have it on the big screen, but if you have your Bible, and I pray you do, open it up or on. And it's Matthew 17, 1. Verse 1, six days later, Jesus took Peter and two brothers, James and John, and led them up a high mountain to be alone. As the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed so that his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. Suddenly, Moses and Elijah appeared and, and began talking with Jesus. Peter exclaimed, Lord, it's wonderful for us to be here. If you, if you want, I'll make three shelters as memorials. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But as even as he spoke, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And the voice from the cloud said, This is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. Listen to him. The disciples were terrified and fell down on their face, on the ground. Face down on the ground. Then Jesus, sorry, then verse 7, then Jesus came over and touched them. Get up, he said, don't be afraid. And when they looked up, Moses and Elijah were gone, and they saw Jesus. So back to Peter. Why is this important? Jesus took Peter, James, and John. Very special. Not all the disciples, but these three men. And Jesus went and he pulled back the veil and revealed his glory. How powerful of an experience that must have been. I mean, that's the thing that that we pray for and we yearn to, to, to one day that we get to see God in all of his glory. No veil. We get to see him. Jesus pulled back the veil and revealed himself to these three men. And on top of that, God spoke, giving him honor and glory. This is my dearly beloved son. 
I just, and obviously the three men fell down to their faces like, we're undone, Lord, we're undone. This is wonderful. And it's interesting that Peter puts this in the, his letter. Again, the Holy Spirit put it there, but Peter was obedient. Because it was kind of a rebuke, because he was like, let me build three. Three shelters here for Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. But God's like, no, this is my dearly beloved son. But after this experience, I just, it's, oh, I'm trying to get ahead of myself. I'm sorry. Number three, <laughs> let's keep reading. Because of that experience, we have even greater confidence in the message proclaimed by the prophets. You must pay close attention to what they wrote, for their words are like lamp shi- a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and Christ the morning star shines in your heart. You would think being an eyewitness to this experience would be enough. However, we must look deeper at what Peter writes here. We have the word of prophecy made more sure. In Greek, this expression allows for two possible translations. The first possibility is, because of the voice they heard, they are better certified than before concerning the prophetic word. However, that would not be the best option. Granted, the New Testament has not been written yet. The second possibility is that the word of prophecy is sure confirmation of God's truth than the voice that came from heaven. Think about that for just a second. Let that soak in. The word of prophecy is sure confirmation of God's truth than the voice that came from heaven. Three men hearing the same thing, seeing the same, same thing, said now, because of that experience, we have even greater confidence in the message of God, in his word. Knowing that experience, do you walk around with your Bible knowing that? Like, surpass hearing God's voice and seeing Jesus in all of his glory, or a part of his glory, that this became more confirmed, more precious of God's truth and understanding. Do you walk around holding that, church? Because of Peter's experience, you must pay close attention to what they wrote. You would do well to take heed in the written word. As unto a lamp shining in a dark place. This is essential because believers, we live in a dark world, a fallen world. We walk in the midst of darkness. And the only light believers have, the only light we have is the light of the word of God. Amen? And we're supposed to be a light, right? Right? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. We're supposed to reflect Christ. We're supposed to be light in this world. For those who are walking in darkness, those who are walking without hope, we have the light. They were once lost, but they can become found. Peter goes on to say that the day is coming when full light of God's revelation will shine in our hearts, when believers will see him as he is. What a day that will be. In a similar way, we're going to go to uh, Romans. Turn with me to Romans chapter 13. In In a similar way of what Peter writes here, Go to verse 12. 
The night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. So remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes and put on the shining armor of right living. Because we belong to the day, church, because we belong to the day, we must live decent lives for all to see. Don't participate in the darkness of wild parties and drunkenness or in sexual promiscuity and immoral living or in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, clothe yourselves with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and don't let yourself think about ways to indulge, indulge in your evil desires. Powerful. Clothe yourselves, church, this morning. We should take heed until the morning star, which refers to Jesus himself, according to Revelation 22, 16, returns again. Jesus is coming soon. He's coming back. More prophecies today continue to come to fruition. He's coming soon, and we need to make sure that we're taking what we're, he, what we're hearing and pursue it as if he's coming tomorrow. Amen? Take heed of the written word. If you've been sleeping, it's time to wake up. If you have been laying in a valley of dry bones, accept the Lord's breath and come alive, church. It is what he desires from you, from all of us. And then verse 20, above all you must, and this is, I'm sorry, back to 2 Peter, chapter 1, verse 20, above all you must realize that no prophecy and scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding. No prophecy came from man's own understanding or interpretation, meaning disclosure. Amongst my studies, I came across Peter Stoner, who was a Christian writer, who wrote, he used math and science along with God's word to make probabilities. And so one of the probability, it, it, it struck me, and I just, I wanted to share that this morning. So when we talk about prophecies, you know, we're like, oh man, yeah, Jesus totally, you know, um, you know, he, 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 how many prophecies that Jesus uh, fulfilled in his lifetime? Does anybody know? What? It's a very specific number. <laughs> Wow, very specific. Yes, a lot. <laughs> but I'm just going to say the most popular eight prophecies, okay? For one prophecy to be fulfilled by one man from the writings of the Old Testament, from what Jesus did, was a big number. But I'm going to share this. I so said, we always read like, oh, man, Jesus fulfilled prophecies. Amen, yay. But do you really feel that you understand the, the heavy, not the heaviness, the, um, I need a big word, um, magnitude, that's a good one, the magnitude of just one prophecy, let alone 300 and some, <laughs> 22. <laughs> Amen. The probability of all eight, let's just say, take just eight prophecies, just eight, okay, not hundreds, being fulfilled accidentally in the life of one person, this is great. That probability would be one in 10 to the 17th power. Now, for you math, math people, that's a lot, right? I needed, I needed to be written out. It's one in... One followed by 17 zeros. A hundred quadrillion. Quadrillion is such a big number that my Grammarly had said, you may want to rethink this word. I said, I think I have it right. Quadrillion. One in 100 quadrillion. 17 zeros. Do you feel the magnitude 
of what Jesus fulfilled? Yeah. It's like, I was wowed before because of God's glory, but like thinking math stuff, not my strong suit, but when you throw a one in a huge number like that, you're thinking, our God is so great. And the ways that he continues to reveal himself. I mean, God doesn't need a number beside of how awesome he is, but I think for us sometimes we read over prophecies like, oh, man, that's awesome that God fulfilled this, and God fulfilled that. But, but for that to happen, out of all the people who existed between the prophets writing the prophecies and Jesus fulfilling them was so many. And one man, Jesus, the Son of God, fulfilled. Wow. That's the God that we serve. That's the God that we come and worship to, right, here today and throughout the week. But we come to celebrate together as community. That's the God that we serve. Amen. Amen. I think that serves rejoice. Thank you, Jesus. Verse 21, or from human initiative. No, those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke, spoke from God. So not only were prophecies in Scripture did not come from prophets' own understanding or disclosure or initiative, no, those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit. Men spoke from God, being moved by the Holy Spirit. Literally, the Greek word used here for moved means to born along. The prophets were born along by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the source of inspiration. The Holy Spirit is the source of revelation. Therefore, the prophets wrote exactly what the Holy Spirit wanted them to write. You know, I'm thankful that, Jesus, that God used broken people. Aren't you? They weren't too righteous, okay? They were sinners. They were broken. They did not have clean clothes on. And God used them to fulfill his glory, his promises. All too often you hear people like, well, I don't, I don't quite agree with the whole Bible. You know, it was written by men, you know. Not, not God, you know, didn't just come from heaven as tablets and, wow, you know, the iPad first gen, you know. It, it wasn't like that. No, God used people who were broken, imperfect, and used him to write his word, his glory. And I'm thankful for that. It gives us hope because of his grace. It gives us hope, church. Man, if, if, if David can make it, any of us can make it, right? Praise God. Paul, a murderer who, who persecuted Christians. Look, look what Jesus did to him. Look what Look what God did in his life because of his obedience, his fruitfulness. We're here. I'm thankful for Peter. I mean, just think about if Peter, I mean, I know God would, could do anything. So even if Peter said, no, God, I'm sure God would have used somebody else. But because of Peter's obedience, look at the fruit that we get to eat from. The fruitfulness of his word, God's word. The Holy Spirit used their personalities, their own styles, their own languages. The Holy Spirit, bearing them along, had them write exactly what is written in the Word of God. The means of growing, church. What Peter writes here is the importance of God's Word. Not that you get it from your your version app every morning at whatever time that you have it scheduled is not considered being in the Word daily. I'm sorry, okay, if, if, that's, if that's you. I'm not condemning you, I'm not judging you, but I'm just telling you the truth. 
Okay, it's not enough. It's not enough to go on Facebook and, and see three awesome scriptures and memes, you know, or hear a, an awesome clip from a, a popular pastor. It's not enough. Because if, if we're to obey God's word here in Second Peter, it is clearly written out for us, not enough. We need to be pursuing the knowledge of God. We need to be pursuing him, to know him, to understand what it is that he has for us in our life. He has a calling and a purpose and is written out here in this perfect story of redemption. From fall to redemption, church. You know, it's only God that this is morally perfect, but also that it does not contradict itself. Out of all the years throughout the beginning and the end of his written word, it never contradicts itself. No matter who out here tries to take things out of context, okay? And it's easy. We see it all the time. It's called false teaching. False teaching. That's what Peter's warning people about. Because if you go on to chapter 2, it talks about false teachers. And we live in that era. We live in that day. You can't turn on YouTube, TV, or go down the road um, in our community, whatever, and not see a false teacher, okay? They're out there. We live amongst them. They live amongst us, okay? How do you know they're false teachers, Pastor? Okay? Understanding the Word of God. Growing spiritually. Okay? Because spiritual infants can get duped. Okay? They can get misled. They can get deceived. Okay? Especially when you have teachers who say things that are not God's truth, but makes your ears tingle. They make them feel happy. Okay? And we see a lot of that. In Matthew 4, 3, says, but Jesus told him, no, the scriptures say, people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Amen? Are you hungry this morning, church? I pray that you are. Because we're living in a time where people, imperfect as we are, sin-natured, who are not grounded in God's word and truth, are being deceived every day by lies, okay? Well, if you just give the church all your money, he will bless you, he'll cure you from cancer, you'll help me in getting a fleet of jets, and that way I can fly around without, you know, immorally perfect people, you know? Like, there's so many people out there that are, 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 are taking God's word and they're manipulating it for their own gain, okay? And God's word clearly says, watch out for these people. But how do we watch out for these people? We need to understand God's word, church. It's not enough just to come and get your filling on a Sunday morning. No, we need to be grounded in this throughout the week. We need to be studying. Do you know how to study the Bible? It's okay to say, Pastor, I don't know how to study the Bible. Okay? It's not a shameful thing. It's just, I I pray that you'd reach out, ask a pastor, ask an elder, ask, you know, ask anybody. Ask those those questions, okay? We're a community, a family, God's body. And if something ain't working correctly on the body, we tend to, you know, blood cells tend to rush and help, right? We're like blood cells. We need to be. All too often we're seeing people making decisions according to what their heart feels or what feels good. Making huge decisions for your family. But are they, are they decisions based off God's word, church? Do you seek him in making big decisions? We've gotten to see a lot of that through these years of making, of people making decisions and saying, I feel that's what God is saying. Do you know you're being held accountable every time that you say that? The magnitude of saying, well, I feel like God's leading me here. No, I'm not, I would never say like, are you sure it's God? You know, I, that's for you, you and God. I mean, now if you're go out, I think I need to kill somebody and I feel like that's what God is leading me to do. I think I could, yeah, I could say, 
I don't think that's God's word. <laughs> you know, let's just go ahead and say, no, it's not God's word, okay? So I think there's a measure that we can speak into, but for the most part, I think people like to hide behind that, you know? I like to hide behind, you know, I think this is what God's leading me to. Or, well, my question is, did you pray about it? Well, no, I just, you know, my perfect heart is, is, is you know, leading me. I was like, well, it's flesh. It's not God. You know, we ask God to come into a heart. It does not make our heart holy, okay? Just saying that out there. We need to be pursuing God's word and his truth and his promises. It is your measuring stick, church, to every decision you should make for you and your family. Men, as you lead your family, lead them first by God's word. By God's word first. Seek him. Seek the kingdom above all else. We need to be growing spiritually. Even church, if it's one step today, worship team, we need to be growing spiritually, even if it is one step forward. We need to make that effort and decision today. Last week, I said, let's, as we read Peter, let's evaluate where we're at spiritually. Whether you've been a spiritual infant for 20 plus years, evaluate where you're at. Because even when we read it in Hebrew, there's, he said there's believers who've been, who've been, who ought to be teaching others by now. They ought to be spiritual parents by now. But yet, no, you're, you're, still, you're still expecting to get bottle-fed the Word of God. We need to grow. We need to grow, church, spiritually. As much effort as we put into growing physically, we need to put even more so into our spiritual growth. So if that is you here this morning, if you identify where you're at in your spiritual walk right now, your, your, your maturity right now, as you identify whether you've been spiritually stunted or you hit a plateau, today is the day for us to make that step forward. We can do it together, church. There's no shame in saying, I'm a spiritual infant. Infants are cute and wonderful. And, we, and, we're, and we're there. It takes a church, right? It takes a church to raise. And as a church, we come alongside of those who are even spiritually babies, okay? To grow them into warriors that know the truth, who are ready for spiritual meat. And then I pray that we go on from that spiritual warrior stage to spiritual parenting, and we start producing more disciples, start producing more, more, more believers and disciplers and missionaries to go out. Now is the time. It's not that we have to wait for something catastrophic to happen in our country for us to go, man, God, this is, really, this is really starting to come downhill. I mean, we should really probably start praying, you know. Like, it doesn't take, don't let it take a catastrophic event for us to get serious about our walk with the Lord. Amen? Let's do it now, okay? You can make the decision right now. And every step forward, you're not going to be alone. I promise you that, okay? Because we're a community. We're a body. And that body comes together to help one another. Amen? Let's stand to our feet. Let's pray.